this way. Uh, I'll give it an audio slate. I'm, I'm rolling. This is January 26, 1998. The Survivor Liberator is Tadishi Tojo. Interviewer Tony Catch Binstock in Honolulu, Hawaii, U.S. United States of America, and is being conducted in English. Do I stop? Okay. I can. My name is Tony Catch Binstock, and today's date is January 26, 1998, and I'm honored today to be interviewing Tadashi Tojo. Sure. In Honolulu, Hawaii, United States of America, and the interview is being conducted in English. Speed, we're rolling anytime you want. Could I have your name, please, and the spelling? Tadashi Tojo, T A D A S H I T O J O. Was that your name at birth also? That is correct. Have you been known by any other names or nicknames? No. Mm. Did you mm. have a Japanese name? Tadashi is, is Japanese. Mm -hmm. And birth date? August 28, 1923. And yeah. your age today? 74. Huh? Mm -hmm. Where were you born? In Honolulu. And do you remember your address before the war? Yes, uh, P.O. Box 884, uh, Wailua, Hawaii. Did you live in an apartment or a house? A house, plantation, camp, it's a, yeah. And describe what the plantation life was like. Uh, my dad had a grocery store. He, he was contracted to come here for, to work in the sugar field, but he, he opted, went into business for himself. Explain about that a little, please. Well, it was a grocery, we had sundries, we had uh, just generally what the little mom and pop store had. Uh, we catered as all, only to the uh, sugar plantation workers. Mm -hmm. And your dad came to, to this country to work in the, pla in the fields? He was country, yes. And where was he from? From Fukushima. Japan, yeah. And what was it like for you growing up there? What kinds of activities did you engage in? It was just fun time for me, yeah, because uh, in a little camp, I think we had maybe uh, 200 people living. Uh, but you knew everybody and everybody knew you. What did you do for fun? Mostly swimming, yeah. And what was your father's name? Shoma, S-H-O-M-A, Tojo. And, and tell about your mother. What was her name? My mother's name was Kikue uh, Norimoto, and she was uh, second generation, so she was American citizen, and she had, uh, had uh, voting privileges at that time, yeah. And your father did not have voting privileges? No, no. He was an alien, so he did not have. Uh, How many siblings did you have? Seven in all, yeah. Would you give me their names? First was Nancy, then came Walter, then came myself, uh, then came Thelma, uh, then came uh, Elaine, then uh, Francis, then uh, Phyllis, yeah, boys. What did your family do together for activities? The store kept my dad and mom most of the time busy. We, we just did whatever was that was for us to do recreation-wise. Uh, what was your religious background? My religious background is Buddhism, yeah. What schools did you attend? Big Bang. Schools did you attend? Oh, uh, Kualoa Elementary, 
in Wailua High, and uh, you went all the way. Um, well, you finished after the war, I think. That's right, said. that's right. But you can mention them now. But you finished before the war up to high school. High school. Now, uh, Wailua is, is on what island? It's on the island of Oahu. Mm -hmm. Were the schools that you attended public or private? All public, yeah. Did you go to school with uh, any Jewish kids, or did, were you aware of any Jew Jews in your neighborhood? I don't recall. Yeah, I don't recall. We had uh, supervisors like Sinclair, and uh, the manager was John Mitgiff. That's about all I, I can think of. And the other Caucasians, is that it? Portuguese, Portuguese. we have, yeah. Did you experience any prejudice growing up in the islands or in in schools? The funny part of it, I, I don't recall any prejudice because you would think, you know, uh, because of the ethnic grouping, but no, we, we had a ball, ball of wax, fun, fun time. Mm -hmm. Were you a student before the war began? No, I... I See, that's when we had uh, all these uh, wartime building activities going on, so we, I went to work in the United States Department of U.S. E, or U, USED, yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, was 50 cents an hour, and that was good pay at that time, yeah. What kind of work did you do? Mostly construction, but uh, after, right after that, uh, we took on a mail contract, so I, I left uh, the uh, wartime activities and went back uh, to uh, uh, mail route. We had RFD. I don't know if you recall that, yeah. Rural free delivery. That's right, that's right. Were you aware what was happening in Europe before? We entered the war? No, that was so a long way off. And, you know, it's different from today where you have instant uh, communication, but no, it, it, that was a long ways off, yeah. Were you aware of what was going on between Japan and the United States before Pearl Harbor? No, those kind of political activities never entered my mind. Yeah. And where were you when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Of all places, I I was. Oh, that that Sunday, uh, I I was washing my dad's bus. He had a bus facility that took children to school. When when he attacked, I had friends at the the uh, fighter air base about two miles down the road, and that's that's when when he started, we ran down and. You know, because of we knew those pilots and uh, people, they told us to back off because things were going on, and we we didn't know until when I saw the uh, Japanese marking on those planes, and I thought that was something strange. Yeah. What other kind of reaction did you have? Did you know what was happening? No, no. I just we know it was a maneuver. There, there were a lot of maneuver session prior to what had happened, but uh, until they really start to fire away, I, I didn't know what, what was going on. Describe what else you saw that day. Big pardon? Describe what else you saw. Not much expects we are asked to go back and stay put, and stay at home, yeah. Did you see bombs exploding, or did you see... No, I saw, I, what I saw was a fighter plane strafing, and that, that's about the extent of uh, that day. Were they close to you? Oh, yeah, we could see right right nearby. And, uh, yeah. and what else happened that day, then? Any other things that, that you recall? Was there um, a roundup, a quarantine? Immediate blackout. Yeah, and you were not supposed to leave the, your home or quarters. Yeah. 
And then how did your life change after that? Explain what happened. Well, one for one, we were, it was a complete uh, hole on everything that we were doing. You couldn't change job. You, you need to do what you were doing. And then when they asked for volunteer to go and in, enter into the U.S. Army, that things start to really roll for me. Yeah. Tell about that. Well, it was an all Japanese uh, Nisei second generation outfit, and uh, I think there was something like five, ten thousand, I think, volunteered, and they selected maybe three or five thousand. I'm not so sure, but it was an all Japanese group, yeah. And what, when was that then? When did you go into the military? 1943, yeah. Tell about what life was like or what was going on after Pearl Harbor till you went into the service. Well, we didn't have much to do. Everything was regimented, yeah. and we were segregated. In fact, I noticed a friend of mine who was still working for uh, the defense. We were given badges to put on. To the Japanese were given badges with a black marking completely around the badge, and that would indicate that you know any other sensitive area you are not supposed to be working. So, you know, you just your work place was limited. That that that's why I, what why I recall. Yeah. What kind of work were you able to do then? Mostly carpentry, mostly carpentry. But that's the environs of uh, the defense area. It was within the environs of the defense? No, it was, was it outside. Yeah, you weren't allowed to go into a so-called sensitive area there at that time, that's what we were told. Did you, what other kind of discrimination did you and your family experience? Well, having a name like Tojo, that was something else. But I didn't look at that uh, as uh, discrimination in that event. I, I anticipated that. I anticipated that because it was building up. You, you could tell you're segregated, you're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do that. But blackout, which was the most, was for everybody. I mean, that's, that was okay, but then they came in to your home to I mean, they're not going to have any, any notice. They just come in and say, wait, we want to ch check the entire place. Now, that's okay, but I remember uh, being a Buddhist, we had a tiny shrine that uh, we had pictures of our ancestors and things like that. And I don't know if, if it was from the FBI or the Army Intelligence that came in and they just start to just ransack. So my dad and my mom just didn't say anything. And I stood over there just for about five minutes and I popped off. And that didn't go over well, but I cursed. I told them you're gonna have a thousand year curse on you for doing that, you know? But you know, you just, it's just, uh, you, just a kid saying something, but I was angry. I was really angry, and uh, I was told to hush up in a very strong words, but it didn't bother me, yeah. But I know my parents were very afraid of that, because I would pop off any time <laughs> things like that would happen. And, but that's the extent. I, 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 as far as the, discrimination go. I didn't think too much of it. In fact, I, I don't think I understood the word discrimination except being told to do this and do that. Who was it that came into your house? Was that the military or...? It, 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 I think it was from the FBI. Did we they have uniforms that you recall? No, that's, that's it. But I know that the Army uh, Intelligence Corps, they, they wore a suit. They didn't come 
in uh, uniform. But uh, I, I thought this young man was well dressed. You know, they, they weren't in uh, army or military uniform. Yeah. Did you continue to earn the fifty cents? No. Then we took the contract. Remember, uh, mm -hmm. fifty cents an hour was big money at that time. But we, my dad. Uh, or oh, asked my older brother, who was of age, to uh, uh, compete for the uh, contract the U.S. Uh, mail service had. And we were successful, so we took over. And that was not considered government, so you could do that? No, that, that was government. But, but I mean, because of our, uh, what do you call it? Uh, we had U.S. Uh, citizenship, so we could work. But at that time, the U.S. mail was allowed to go anywhere we, we wanted. So we went into Hickam, uh, not, not Hickam, uh, Schofield, which was the largest uh, Army ground force base. Then. Uh, Camp Malakoli, uh, we, we, we passed through, I mean on our way we passed by Pearl Harbor, on Oak, I see Wheeler Field, that was not a base that we were able to get into. And did you still have the black badge, and you and you were able to go in? That's what I was confused about. We, that, at the time, we, the U.S. mail don't allow using badges. Okay, I'm a little confused then. So after the after the war started, mm -hmm. and you had to wear the badge, and you did carpenter work. That's when we worked for the government. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was there a time, or did they? Uh, were you threatened with being um, relocated, or your father? Any problem with your father, who was not a U.S. citizen? Yes, uh, because he had uh, he was an official at the Buddhist uh, temple. They came and checked him out. But because of what he was doing, he had a bus line. He had a. Uh, a t store they allow him after that to stay. Yeah. Now tell me about your military career. You said you went in in 1943. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the month? I think it was March 1943. Did you have any obstacles in terms of getting into the military, being Nisei? No, that, that was strictly for uh, the Nisei to volunteer for this this group, and the only objection I had, I didn't tell my parents when I signed up. That was my next question. What did your parents think about that? Okay, in the Japanese family, uh, the eldest son normally would take over whatever the the, the family would do. So. so being number three in the family, we were expendable. So I didn't say that. I know they were discussing who should volunteer, but I didn't say. I just went out and signed up and came back and told them without they knowing it. Then, then everything hit the wall because my dad said, why didn't you come? But it wasn't necessary because I, I thought at that time uh, my eldest brother would, would never my dad would never release him. But that, I think that I relieved a lot of pressure in him. But I just got a hell for it. Yeah, okay. What did your mother think? My mother was really sad. My dad was relieved, I can see that. <laughs> but uh, I thought, uh, no, but my mother was really sad. I, I was his pet, yeah because I always got into trouble. No matter what happened, when we got, we, we, we had a group, we always went after the military that was there in our area. 
And as soon as the MPs or the police came, he, he really started yelling, where, where am I, you know? And I told Mama, I'm right here. And I said, have you been, are you been involved in that? Usually I'll say no, but that's what they were looking for, okay? When you went into the military, did you have to take a loyalty test? Oh, yes, yes. No, I mean, what, everybody would go through that when you, you would pledge allegiance. And, did you have any problem with that? No, no, no. And so you went into the military and describe where you went for basic training and so forth. Okay, we started off in school field. That we didn't have a basic just gathering over there and then they shipped us off I guess within a week after we got in. So we didn't have any training over here. We shipped off uh, to Camp Shelby, and wh what I thought was strange, uh, when we got to San Francisco, San Francisco is a series of hills over there, all. and there were some people, all, all the person than I, who'd been to Fra San Francisco maybe once in their lifetime, and they say, all of us lined up on the uh, railing, we're looking over, I say, that's Beverly Hills. No, right? They, I rode home. I, I, saw, I saw Beverly Hills. Then my sister rode back. and said Beverly Hills was a couple of hundred miles down in L.A. <laughs> so, you know, it, it would be just a naive individual. But what happened after we got off the ship? We got on a train, and it, all the... Uh, we had those uh, shades we used to pull down. All of them were pulled down. They didn't want us to see any portion of California or whatever, especially California. Why do you think that was? I really don't know, but I, I imagine they, they would think that we're going to see some. Because that from Oakland, I think, yeah, some from Oakland, we had to go a journey through a lot of area to get to, you know, but I know after we left California, they allowed us to pull off the shades. But people, uh, be, being our group age, people just yank, and we're not allowed to look out because <laughs> the shade is gone, everything busted, you know. <laughs> but. Yeah, we've been instructed to look not out the window. Okay, that that to me was, I think it was comical. Yeah, yeah. Okay. How many were with you uh, on the ship, or that did you come? I forgot to ask if you came over on ship or if you were flown over. Ship, Metsonia. I think it was Metsonia or Lurleen, but it was uh, the present Metson uh, line. 3,000 of us. You all came together then? Mm -hmm. And everybody went on the same train? Everybody on the same train. They had my several shuttle train, I guess. Yeah. And Camp Shelby was in? Harrisburg, Mississippi. Yeah. Were there any uh, Americans of Japanese ancestry officers? AJA officers, or were they all Caucasian? It was an all Caucasian officer group, but the non coms, non commissioned officers, were people from the mainland because they were there before us. So they, I get divided all the non com position amongst themselves, and everybody from Hawaii was, I think, I, I could almost say all of us were. Genuine privates, you know. Yeah. And what unit did you join? The number. Uh, okay, we. See, it, it was 442nd Regimental Combat Team, but we had engineering outfit, artillery, and service. But it was a complete cohesive unit that could go into any breach or any battle as a whole unit with the necessary firepower in the infantry uh, group. 
And did you experience any racial or religious discrimination? No, except uh, I now I I think it was in Shelby when when we asked our religious uh, belief in most of us were Buddhists. I remember the uh, officer asking, we do not have any Buddhist religion in the U.S. Army, so uh, take a pick of whatever religion you're going to be, probably. He didn't say that. Okay. Now, probably I was one of the guys on the end, so he asked me, what you going to be? I said, do I have a choice? He said, no. I said, all right. I said, I'm a Protestant. He said, that's good. That's good, you know. But then he has happened to ask me, why did you select? Why not Catholic? Why not a Baptist? I said, because I protest. And if everybody else were Buddhist, most of them, I, I, I never, you know, I couldn't understand whatever religion they would have. So for that, I did like uh, latrine duty. Now when <laughs> for for maybe a week, right through. Uh, but you you realize that I didn't understand okay, what latrine duty meant. Uh, I thought maybe it's something to do with excavation or something. But when I found out that I had to do latrine chores. I wasn't happy. But you know, it's they didn't give you a choice what religion you wanted to be. You either gonna take up Catholic, Baptist, whatever. But he didn't like the idea when I saw I am a Protestant because I protest. That didn't go over well with him and I, I just said what I felt inside me. Yeah. Did you have any other incidences of prejudice that you recall? No, except I've seen signs where for blacks only, you know, they didn't say colored, for blacks only. In a bus, you know, they always put uh, people in the back of the bus. But we had a lot of scrap on that because uh, the Japanese people, uh, soldiers were allowed to sit in the front, but they would stand up for the black ladies or ladies with a child in their arms. And that created a lot of problems. I, I know this. We were constantly uh, against that. What, did, what kind of problems did it cause for you? Ex except for Every day, probably every day we, we, we're in a scrap. I think we'll end of this tape and continue on the okay. next tape. Okay, all right. You were saying about shutting down, we're shutting down and going to tape two. This is tape two, January 26, 1998. The uh, liberator is Tadashi Tojo. Interviewer is Tony Catch Binstock in Honolulu, Hawaii, United States of America, and is being done in English. You were telling at the end of the last tape about the um, blacks in the South, and I was asking what kind of trouble you got into or what, what would happen when you gave your seats and so forth. Well, that, that's why we, we went into fights and we were not allowed to go home passes because of, uh, I guess, the incident that been created, but almost daily that happened, almost daily. But we knew they weren't allowed into uh, restaurants and places like that. And you always used the back door. Did uh, you ever see any black soldiers? No, not, not, see, I, I don't recall, not in Hattiesburg. Yeah. And as, as um, Nisei they, you were not discriminated against, then you could sit anywhere you wanted on Any the bus. Any restaurant, uh, yeah. 
You mentioned before about the 442nd, some were from the mainland. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Tell me how everybody got along, the Nisei from the islands and from the mainland. Uh, that's a very good question because we spoke mostly pidgin, okay? And the Nisei is because of the schooling educational background in the mainland, they spoke perfect English. So that's another area of confrontation. Uh, and then, of course, they're mostly non-coms, commission officers. <coughs> that, that really started a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. But that that's to be expected because you regimented into a group, you know, all men and, you know. Anything else that you can tell about that? About the the troops getting used to each other? No, aside from the training session, uh, everybody did their share, so it wasn't a really cohesive unit while training, but once we got trained, ready to go, it really gelled. I mean, I thought it was it's wonderful that. Uh, <laughs> well, it, I mean, I still remember Sergeant the Nisei Sergeant telling me, "You know, you guys speak funny." <laughs> I still remember that, you know. But that's the way we spoke. There's no way we're going to be able to change that. But that pigeon. Japanese, knowing Japanese, came in handy as far as I was concerned in communication work in, in, at the battlefront. Did you get any special training? <coughs> Excuse me, in communication? Yes, I, I went to a enlisted communication school in Oklahoma, in Fort Seal, Oklahoma. And when was that? That was during our training period, so it was 40. The end of 43, Still right after basic, yeah. Were there any family or friends that were with you from the islands? People that you knew that went over with you? No, I didn't have any family uh, friends, but I mean relationship, but relatives, but uh, oh yes, a lot of friends from, from our area. Were you told where you were going to speak? be serving, or did you know if you would be in the European or the Pacific Theater? No, we, we didn't have any idea. We just trained for wherever they were going to send us. <clears throat> did you ever visit a relocation center in the, on the mainland? Yes, twice. Tell about that. I didn't understand the, uh, the reason for sending those people to the relocation camp for what little uh, I read about it. However, what really st struck me was when I saw these graves over there, okay? Usually, uh, Buddhist people get cremated, but this was burial ground. And I thought this was in Roa, uh, Arkansas, and Jerome, Arkansas. There's two camps. When I thought, in retrospect, when I think about it, I thought, it's a really a sad thing to be buried out there. That was really a area that nobody wanted. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonder how they set up a camp. But I imagine they want for security reason to isolate uh, groups, but I think that was one of the only thing I wrote back what was happening to me in the army uh, to my sister, indicating to her that, you know, to see graves buried almost in a foreign area. I mean, it's really a forlorn thing for the family who's been incarcerated, but you can't help it, but that really, to this day, uh, I, I think about it, you know, and how things can be done 
uh, almost as a convenience. They'll do it, you know. Yeah, because then you see the watchtower with people up there with uh, their own, own rifle and stuff. And you probably have fence about 10 feet high, you know. It, but I, I enjoyed going there, one, because they had Japanese food. <laughs> they, they provided you with it. I, I couldn't get used to, to um, potatoes for a long, long time. But I, I would go on an excursion when they went to those camps just to go and eat. Did you, how did you hear about the relocation camps? Ah, uh, they sent uh, girls to come down. We had a USO, and the USO, and the, I think it was the Red Cross arranged for dancing and stuff like that. Yeah, that, I thought that was nice. I thought that was and they came from the relocation camps? That's right. Did you know any of the people in the relocation camps or any in uh, either one of those Arkansas towns that you knew from here? Okay. Most of them were uh, from Hawaii, were really uh, uh, so-called. Uh, they, they really studied them and sent them. Either they were Buddhist priests or people in, in the high uh, newspaper uh, or banking. And they were sent to Crystal Spring, Texas, where that, that was really a place where it was really isolated. We couldn't go. But the other people that I met, as soon as I found out there's few people from Hawaii, but those were the people already relocated to California. And they were established in California. They were shipped in. But aside from that, they, they told me where they're from and things like that. But even then, it was nice to meet with them, yeah. Describe a little bit more about the relocation camp. There were 10-foot barbed wire fences? I think taller than that. And guarded with guards? That's right. What were the barracks like? Did you ever see the barracks or where the people stayed? Do you know, the barracks almost reminded me of uh, the uh, feeder camps in uh, Germany. It's top paper. No, no heating facilities. <clears throat> they had to make do with whatever they had. I think they were using at the time they were using straw too for the bedding. But you know they had to make do with what they had, and they had kitchen facilities. They have, oh, they had schooling too. They had a lot of great school teachers, and professional people. There was. Were whole families, to, oh, were yes. they able to stay together? Right. The families were able to stay together? Mm -hmm. It's not partition, it's just one open, open room. And they did take whole families then? Oh, yes. It, everyone, lock, stock, and barrel. Do you have any bitterness about that? You know, personally, I didn't. I thought, well, maybe that was necessary, but... Uh, I still remember that General DeWitt, I think his name was, and, you know, when, when, you, I, when I think about it, I didn't think, well, that, that was necessary. I, that's the only way I could think, of. otherwise we'd go baddie, yeah. And you, you were saying that you went to Fort Sill. Uh, tell about your communication training. Yes, we did really uh, intensive training, three months. And uh, most of the non com the cadre over there were in Fort Seal, artillery people were a lot yeah. from Hawaii, had, uh, the uh, Caucasian non coms and officers were a lot from Hawaii, and they were really nice. I, I really enjoyed Fort Seal, Oklahoma. I think there were six of us, three from the mainland and three from Hawaii, oh, in that particular class that we went to. Were they Nisei? Oh, yes, Nisei. yes. See, in Hawaii, we have commercial uh, courses 
at eighth grade, you, they're going to insist that you learn typing. And that did us really well because we ended up in the office group in F4, Silo, Oklahoma. We, three of us, the only one knew how to type. And that, that's the reason why well, it was, I thought it was something, you know. We had good privilege as far as going to uh, lunch and, you know. We had most, because I was the one that, those days, it didn't have a Xerox machine. You remember that, that thing that you crank up and it comes out? I was in charge of all the passes. <laughs> so my class, ECC 39, I bought 80 or 90 people. Most of them went everywhere. And I remember the colonel asking me, how come ECC 39? I said, I really don't know. I mean, I, I was the one rolling out the passes. But they, they're going to, or oh, a lot in Oklahoma was the town right outside of Fort Hill. And they get into fights, and that, that's when the MPs came back and said, most everyone is from class 39. <laughs> I still remember that, yeah. But, okay. Mm. Was that, that was still part of the 442nd then? No, that, yeah, I was in the 442nd detached to the communication school. Do you know where, uh, who originated the name Go For Broke? I really don't know, but actually it was give it all. I, I, that's, that's the uh, interpretation I was, uh, don't hold back, just give it all. When did you first hear that? As soon as we got in. Yeah, as soon as we got in. Yeah. After Fort Sill, then what happened? Then I went back to uh, the, uh, we were already having uh, maneuvers. That's when we went to Louisiana maneuver. That was really, uh, it was cold, wet, but it was a good training for us. It was good training for us. What kind of training was that? Actually, uh, that's the first time I realized I have to go with the foot soldiers. Yeah, and then you have the blue and the red uh, maneuvering against each other or with each other, yeah. At that time, did you know anything about the treatment of Jews or non-Jews in Europe? Did, were you aware of any of that at that time? We had no idea. I, I didn't have any idea. Probably others would, but we. I don't recall. I don't recall. Uh, even when 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 we were in when we were not in the army, I I don't recall. It, that's how slow. I mean, not rapid like it is today. I mean, today you're gonna see what's happened two hours ago, but not not then. It has to come through UP or Reuters, and by the time it comes, well, see. Those days, we had a Japanese and American, uh, but they didn't, I, I, I didn't recall anything to do with the Jewish uh, people. And how long were you in Louisiana then? It was a three month. Uh, uh, I, actually, I mean, when did you leave Louisiana? Louisiana, we left in the maybe November or December to go back to the camp and get prepared and retrain again. And then we, we sailed off, I think in the spring or May, I think. I'm not so sure. What year would that be? Spring of 40? No, no, okay. No, see, because our training is, uh, No, it's it's the latter part of forty three because we're on our way to Europe and it took us a month from uh, Newport News, uh, Virginia to uh, Brindisi on the other side of the uh, hill of uh, Italy. I really don't recall the month but 
It wasn't long before we finished the maneuver, we went back, then we shipped out. Do you remember what ship you went over on? It was okay. one of those uh, Navy, uh, no, it wasn't, no, it was, uh, uh, I think, I, I'm not so sure it was a Navy transport or regular. Uh, and where did you land first? First was Brindisi in Italy. Yeah, printed because we're on floating reserve now that uh, I've read back on some of the history. We're on floating reserve, but at that to Anzio. But Anzio was in really a hot spot, so we circled around the hill of uh, uh, Italy and we landed in Brindisi, uh, Italy. Then we took a train from there to uh, Naples. Mm. How many were with you? All of us, about 3,000 of us. Still but the, still now the with the augmentation of the uh, uh, mainland uh, Nisei, we're up to about the strength of about 5,000, something like that. And what battles were you in? As a forward observer group, I was in all the, more, in fact, most of the battle all the way up to uh, Leghorn, Italy. Can you mention those battles, or do you remember them? Gee, I, I don't recall to my, I get, now see, when it comes to battle, I get confused whether it was in Italy or France. But I think in that uh, book that I gave, it, sh it should indicate to you all the battle, the uh, date and the time. Were you a foot soldier all that time then, from the time you got to Italy? At, were you a foot soldier? No, foot soldiers were designated as infantrymen. We were artillery observers. I mean, it's not any more higher than wherever it is. You're going to get shot at anyway. So were you, you were part of the artil artillery then? That's right. It, what was your rank? Uh, then I was uh, technical five, which is... Corporal. Did your unit ever take any prisoners? Uh, you mean 442nd? Yes, many, many. In fact, they were sent out on four days at night just for informational purposes to go and had pick on prisoners and bring it back. Tell about that if you would. I don't know because I know that the next day you see the prisoner because mostly they were looking for maps. And so we had maps because we need to establish our base point and where we're at. We were using National Geographic. I, I know a couple of times when I <coughs> saw the map was National Geographic uh, topography. But we wanted uh, the German troops and that was the most important thing as far as information goes. Even for that particular sector, they had superior uh, maps. They had superior maps. Did, the, did they usually get them for you? Did you usually get them from the Germans? No, the, that's when it goes. I go mean, when, you got the, when, you, they, when they got the group that went out to get them, brought them back, they did bring back. But not for us, it's for the uh, headquarters. Uh, at the full forty second. Did you have any contact with civilians in either Italy or France? Most of the time. Because we need to know direction. So we need to learn Italian and French like that. You know. So at least we could ask them where's the bridges and what road it'll take to a certain town. Tell about your duties, <coughs> please. What, what I did, I was just a communication person. My lieutenant was the uh, obse observer, and he had a te technician, a corporal, that do all the map reading for him. And I, they give us, two of us were the communication person. They give us the information we call back to the unit indicating base points 
they, they would tell us that what the base, either it'd be a bridge or an overpass, those are marker that's very uh, noticeable on the terrain map. And we use that as base point. And if, say, if the uh, troop is, German troop is on the left of the base point, we'll indicate that. And what they'll do, they'll shoot a fire, a smoke round, a phosphorus round, to mark so whether it went over or below, and right or left. And that's how we begin to get an idea. But that's when uh, Mr. Shimazu, he was our hotshot at the uh, fire direction center who knew a lot of things. Okay. But we provide the information and they send it back to the battalion. We had three uh, bat uh, batteries of four guns each, so 12 guns, all shift at the same time to that particular target. It's, they, were, they did wonderful. I mean, I won't say killing people is wonderful, but uh, for our act, what we are required to do, they did wonders with uh, that type of information. We, one of the things that pigeon and Japanese came into effect, we knew a lot of time that the Germans were zeroed in on our communication line. We had uh, very rapid uh, high frequency radio, but they, they, they knew what, what frequency, because it was actually a, a quartz thing that you set in for your community, and you communicate. Your communication is, I guess, easily detected by them. So <laughs> they'll give you a lot of code. I'm not good in remembering codes. I fl just flip it off. Then I speak Japanese and Hawaiian and pidgin to my contact back at the guns or to back at where Don Shimazu people were. And we spoke in pidgin, Japanese, and never in English. <laughs> you know, take for instance, we knew at that base point, say, base point 34, there was a uh, dead German draft horse. Maki in uh, Hawaiian is dead. Then you have Uma, which is horse. Say, base point 39, let's say. Maki Uma. It's a dead horse. That, that's how we based, because if you're going to go through a lot of coded things, you'll never get through. And it, the movement in the line is so rapid, so you need to do some, some changes. And that's when t I thought uh, our communication was really good, really good. Even the Japanese from uh, mainland didn't understand what we're talking, speaking, you know. But we got the work done, yeah, yeah. I remember the lieutenant asking me on the side, he said, what you talking about, you know? I said, I'll get the message through, you know? And lo and behold, there's a round coming in and marking base point 39. Yeah. But that's one thing that uh, the communication school never taught us. But we had to make do in that, in that circumstances. Even at night when, see, maybe you were two or three days out on the front with the infantry. Now, the infantry not going to provide you in transportation back to your unit. So uh, when I, we have a change in a group on our way back, we forgot our coded message. See, usually it's, uh, if they tell you Brooklyn, you say Dodgers. you got to have that. But they'll change that every night. 
Thank you. I think we'll end this one now and then start the next tape. This is tape three, <coughs> excuse me, January 26, 1998. The liberator is Tadashi Tojo, interviewer Tony Catch Binstock in Honolulu, Hawaii, United States of America, and is being done in English. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about your lieutenant. What was his name? The lieutenant who, who asked you what you guys were talking about. That was Lieutenant Binari. Uh, he's from Texas. I mean, a great big Texan. On a march, you know, we need. Oh, on a march, <laughs> I'm sorry. On a march, we need to do one and a half step because his one step would be our one and a half step. He was that tall. I mean, a ramrod Texan. Him and Captain. I only could remember Binotti because he was here during the last uh, reunion, yeah. But uh, he was the one who was more confused. I should have spoken in Italian maybe to him, you know, but he was ex affectionately known as Paisan, our friend. Yeah, our friend. Did any of the Nisei become officers? Oh, yes, toward the end it was. Balcom uh, yeah. Did you uh, ever come in contact with any of the German soldiers that were taken prison, prisoners? Yes, over there in uh, Belvedere, France. Yeah, we may, uh, we we had uh, a German officer. I mean, he spoke excellent English, but he say he could, you know, not speak English at all, but he was ramrod straight. They, they, they forced him to say a, say a few words, uh, but he was all soldier. Now, that's the only one I remember sitting in, in the same room where they were interviewing him, but they couldn't get... Uh, they, were they asking him questions in English or in German? One of them, of all boys, spoke German well. And he, he really is spreading the Zeitsch, you know, you know, all the way down. Yeah. I was surprised. Some of the, we had a lot of them from uh, University of Hawaii that had uh, language background. And they were, especially at that time, French was very popular. They were, they were in the limelight in France, but uh, there were few, I noticed, speaking in German to the officer. Did he answer in German, or did he answer in any language? Well, he gave a round, that's a good soldier, I say. he gave in a roundabout, but we already had some of the prisoners at that group, they had maps. We didn't care whether he gave us information or not. Yeah. Did you encounter any Jews in the service at all? In yes. He was one of my favorite, Captain Feibelman. He and I were in in this... Uh, we're going to have to quit for just one second. That's we right. A, a problem with the equipment. Okay. Yes, thank you. And we had to stop because they needed to change the battery mm -hmm. and the equipment. So mm -hmm. you were telling us about the Jewish officer that you were friendly with, a yes. Jewish person. Kep Captain Feibelman was on, uh, he wasn't with our group at, at, the at the observation post, but we came back into this uh, little uh, village. Uh, quarters, and it was two stories, I remember, top, top and bottom. Normally they kept animals in the bottom, but th this was a very nice uh, farm farm shed. Then the Germans, the German troops started to fire. The tanks came, the German tanks came. We couldn't get out from that building. And the 
top portion start to burn and start to drop on us. And he and I was underneath the kitchen table. And he's a type of person that has a five o'clock shadow, even at nine in the morning. Anyway, he told me, do you have something that we could read? I said, what do you mean, a, uh, a Bible or something like that? And I happened to have a, I don't know if the Red Cross gave it to me or, uh, anyway, there was some passages in there. To this day, I couldn't find the passage. And if I'm not mistaken, that uh, passage was prayer for trying times, all right? And I, I told him, don't you have one? I, he said, no, <laughs> because you're not going to take, but I just happen to have that. And he and I just, that, that's when I became a good Protestant, and I had to rely, I couldn't be doing Buddhist Sutra to him. Anyway, we got through that, that crisis. That's when we, uh, oh, that's when I had to take my radio, and the unburned portion, we had to jump off because the tank was firing from our left, and we had to get out on our right. That's when I jumped out of the window, all right, but I twisted my ankle, and that's what he called out. If you broke your feet or leg or whatever, they call it a million dollar wound. So I was really happy. I'm going to tell you. But no, the medic came and said to me, told you, you just have a sprained ankle. Don't take off your shoes. That was it. That, but coming back to Captain Fiberman, he came, incidentally, he passed away about 10 years ago. When he came back, the first thing he did was brought his wife and said, Mama, this is the person that we, he and I prayed under the table. I said, you still remember that? He said, I'll never forget that. You know, it's it's a real close feeling at that time. We couldn't get out. We could never get out from the front door because only we could do is jump off the second floor. But, you know, I was, I was just really sad when he passed away. The word came back. But he was the only one I, I can think of right now that uh, had the Jewish background. He was an attorney, a uh, cooperative attorney. He remember told me, telling me that. I said, wow, well, you got buku money then. I told him, you know. But that, that's about uh, uh, my experience. Was he assigned to your unit? Yes, yes. Do you know how his spelling of his name, what was it? F-I-B-E-L-M-A-N. Um, did you ever hear the radio access Sally or Lord Haha uh, when you were in your battles? Did you ever hear on the radio? No, we didn't have that, that type of amenities. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you had gone in from Italy into to France, France and then continue on with Wales. Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. What happened then? Well, the biggest battle, I think, came in, in France, all of a heavy battle came in France, and there, 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 everywhere we went, they're just waiting for us, you know. But I think the biggest battle was when we had to go in and rescue the uh, Texan Texas group, about five hundred of them. Tell about that. I have something written up on it too, but. Uh, that was known as, uh, that, that was in uh, Bruyers. I just, we went there for our 50th reunion. Now, there was this hill we had to negotiate to get to the Texas, 
Texas group. They, in fact, uh, relieved us, and they said they, they, they're going to take over. But the Germans are waiting for them. They surrounded the whole battalion. I, th I, think, I, I really don't know what the number. I think it was a battalion usually is four, four companies. So I, I really don't know whether it was one company or the entire battalion, like 500 people. Normally, battalions are... In our artillery outfit was 500. Well, anyway, uh, there was this hill that we had to negotiate, and that's when the only time we ever used uh, bayonet. When fixed bayonet came down the line, they told your artillery observers, "We don't need uh, your services now. We're going to go right up." But we didn't want to be left alone in the back. So I, I used to carry a Thompson submachine gun, and that was an issue to me, but that would do a lot of rapid firing. So I had that with my radio. And there was no way of, I didn't have bayonet or anything, but I figured, you know, I had about 150 rounds of ammunition with me. But when they charged up that hill, it was something, because you gonna be, I mean, they just drew it down the hill, and they went right up that hill. Uh, they called it Banzai Hill. Yeah. Banzai is just mm. oh, what, so many thousand years. Uh, anyway, they use that term. That no, hill is known to us as Banzai Hill. But I still remember, I think, People we were attached to that group had 71 person when they charge up. When they regroup, 17, including us, lined up. And most of them were injured, and of course a lot of them died. But that how huge <laughs> loss we had. For that particular uh, uh, battle, and uh, to this day, it, you know, it was something. You didn't have a chance if you stand up, but you have to go negotiate that hill. They finally did. Then I still remember the first thing the liberated GIs. In the exuberance, I guess, some of them start to cry. That made me really afraid because we, we, we haven't secured that area yet. You need to have, you know, a secure position in a counterattack. But I, I could still remember the first thing one of the soldiers said, can I have a smoke? You know, so today when you think about tobacco and all that, that's the only thing they wanted. So we, had, we try to fire in, fire into that group, uh, fruit bars, chocolate, and some food in an artillery shell. So we removed the explosive. Where did you fire those into? Into, into that group where they were surrounded. Because they didn't have any food for a while. Now, were those Americans? Yes, those were the Texans. Uh, well, those excuse were the me. Texans. Yeah. So, but the trouble is because of the rainy condition and the soggy ground, the shell went up all right, but it penetrated the ground to an extent you can't dig it out. Then, of course, the Air Force came in, and because it was on a pinnacle, it's a flat top pinnacle. All the food that was brought in on parachute went into the German hand. So, you know, they, they were starving. They, mostly they didn't have water. And I still remember to this day, do you have a smoke? You know, it's, 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 it's ironic, but that's, that's what it was. And they, I thought they would ask for food. No.
where, what unit were you with, or where were you just prior to your liberation experience? Well, you mean uh, in the Dachau area? See, we came in, I still remember bivouacking or stop uh, in Heidelberg, Germany. We jumped off from Francis, uh, Kaiserslautern. Then we, we were taken over by the Navy. Now, mind you, the Navy took us over. That the, uh, uh, what, it wasn't, not the Daniel River. What's that huge river that goes through? Uh, to, I could, I've already forgotten that. But it was uh, not the Elbe, it was, uh, it was anyway, in Germany we had to negotiate. Then of all things, the Navy, I remember the Navy uh, person telling, don't worry, the Navy will take you over, you know. And he got razzed for that. You know, he said, you're going to be leaving after the job, but it's over, you know, things like that. But anyway, uh, they had, the Navy was really thorough. They even had net right across the, the Rhine River. That was it was, okay, the Rhine River. They laid smoke screen, and the people, it, it, I mean, well, the landing craft, the small landing craft got shot up too. So whatever people that got dumped in the river in Rhine, they had landing nets so you could cling on to that. That, I thought, was very thorough of the Navy. You know, we have to give credit. Credit is due. But that, that's how we crossed the Rhine River. Then I remember going through, I don't know how many days expired, going through uh, Heidelberg. And that's when this, um, this is where the famous Heidelberg. In fact, we, we, we're near past, I think we stopped over at the campus before going down south. I think Heidelberg is already in the southern part of uh, Germany, yeah. But from then on, it was uh, just a race between the German army and us. But there were the lines, I mean, the battle lines were so fluid we didn't know whether we were ahead or be, be behind. There's no way you could rapidly communicate between units now. It's a huge uh, area, yeah. Were you still following the Ger I mean, you could, could, were you in contact with Germans at that point? Intermittently, yeah, we were in contact, but they were, they were in a retrograde move, so they're always moving, but uh, they they very thorough in moving back. I mean, they, they're not just going to hold, sort of, abandoning. So it was fluid, yet it was it's an oddly retrograde movement from what I, I would recall, yeah. Because we could not just go through at free willing, yeah. Were you told about the existence of concentration camps? There's, that's the strange part of it. I have no idea that a uh, camp like that uh, existed. You were not told what you might encounter? I don't think anybody knew. Yeah. Where was your unit just prior to arrival at the camp? See, th this is where I, I want you to check with uh, our historian. But I remember on a foray, we going going uh, movement up toward the front, uh, coming to this camp, and I was because of the movement I was on on this uh, reconnaissance uh, tank uh, M M M thirty five. I think that's the nomenclature for that. Anyway, we arrive at this barbed wire. Uh, encampment, not knowing, but like I say, it reminded me of that uh, camp in Roa and Jerome, but those were double deck. The one in Germany were double deck. Double deck, you mean? Two story. Okay. So 
the lead tank, we, we were on a, in on a lead tank. It's a reconnaissance vehicle, so we pull back and let the big tank, it's a it, TD, oh, I forget the number, nomenclature, but it was a tank destroyer. It's a huge tank. They went in and go, went over the, uh, it was locked, the gate. I did it just drove right through it. But uh, they just wanted to know what it was. When we went in there, I think we stayed there for maybe five or ten minutes. But that's the first time I've seen uh, people that was incarcerated. Then I start to remember the striped shirt, the designated uh, people that, uh, that the Germans were using for almost and labor. Now, but the this camp is a, actually a feeder camp. In the environment of uh, Dachau, there were more than 80 feeder camps, almost 90, I understand. So these people evidently was beyond help. They, they, they're going to be shipped back to Dachau, cre cremated. And, yeah. Now, nobody spoke anything. So that so one of the things that I didn't write back about the incident, but when I came back, they asked me to speak at gatherings. So I said, they reminded me of zombies. Now, people, they're very sensitive. You know, you're not supposed to describe human beings as zombies, but they didn't speak. They didn't have a word. They just milled around with a blank stare. That's the impression to this day I have. And they, because of the lack of food, the gas started to accumulate in the abdomen and they were just swollen. But there's no way you could feed them. In, in fact, they trying, one medic tried to provide intravenous. They couldn't locate the vein in the arm. So Evidently, they, they do walk, so you, you, the only place they located was at the ankle. But I remember the first shot, where I don't know whether it was saline solution or sugar. I seen that person shiver, and he immediately took it out because it's not working. He might, he might die out of heart failure because of the traumatic experience he's getting, you know, at least there's some food entering his system. But that's one time that it's completely stopped. Yeah. But not a word was said. And I know the, the tank commander backed off and we just drove out of there. We're still looking for the battlefront. You, did the, when the tank went into the barbed wire, was there any electrical no, it, it, everything, it, I didn't see any sparks or anything flying, but I know they bust, busted right through. There was, I thought it was a ditch or a moat, but actually it was a mo looked like a ditch that surrounded that area. That, that, I mean, anyway, that gate area. But I still remember the uh, reconnaissance uh, lieutenant saying we're looking for a Bahnhof, which is a train station. Okay, we saw the railroad track, but that was for transporting goods in and out, whether it was pri prisoner war or whatever. And I still remember the term Bahnhof, which is a German for railway station. And probably that, that was proper de demarcation line where the Germans should have been. But we couldn't find because that Bahnhof or train tracks entered into uh, Dachau, but from the feeder, they used the same thing to transport either the workers or whatever to that camp. But it was well organized as far as uh, uh, transportation system go, but that, that I still remember. Okay. 
Do, were there any guards in the towers? Did you see? No, they were all around? gone. It was so quiet. That's the reason why N no prisoners was out on uh, in in the area. But on the way back, I seen this uh, prisoner of war. That's the first time I saw the Star of David. Well, before you say, you say, um, so you left that area then and went someplace else? We went else? back to our unit. Went back to, yeah. okay. Yeah, uh, to regroup again, okay. That's when I saw these prisoners of war milling about, but they were physically able to walk out of there. I don't know what compound now they walked out of. And they were bathing and drinking from the, uh, uh, what do you call it? ditches in the field. And actually, the, the, uh, but what, what I saw on the road is this uh, prison of war. I mean, those, those inmates. The Germans use a draft horse. I think we'll stop the tape mm -hmm. now, we'll mm -hmm. continue on the next mm -hmm. tape. I don't want to interrupt that. That's no, no, no. <coughs> and I didn't. Sorry. Okay. Did you see that again? Audio's on now. Okay, we okay. have to start again. Mm -hmm. This is tape four, January 26, 1998. The liberator is Tadashi Tojo, interviewer Tony Catch Binstock in Honolulu, Hawaii, United States of America, and the interview is being conducted in English. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to, to, do you remember what day this was that you went, you went into this camp? Remember the date? It's a latter part of April, so because I t distinctly remember May 1st. So April being 30 days, so it must have been 27, the 30th. Okay. What time of, of day was it that you entered? I think it was I in the morning, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Because, uh, see, we have to have our own fetal ration because we're moving. We don't have any cooking facilities. But uh, getting back to these people, on the roadway, uh, they're literally stripping the uh, draft force. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was draft force because the German army used draft force to transport, do a lot of work with horses. Uh, I recall using that term again. These were the, I said, these were the fortunate ones to this group that I was addressing. <laughs> Somebody really popped up. He said, what do you mean by the fortunate one? I said, they're able to consume, they were able to eat, they're able to move out, they're able to bathe, and things like that. Then, then I guess I must have got his attention quiet down. but. You know, it dawned on me after a while to see they're, they're really sensitive about words being used in 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 a gathering. They asked me to speak to them and just saying out loud what I thought inside me. But you could imagine uh, they had no facility to cook. I mean, the the com that carcass was completely uh, stripped. And I said, yeah, they were fortunate. They could eat raw meat. Do you know what happened to them? I've never from, seen... From eating the raw meat? No, that's why I had never seen. Usually you would think at, at that time when I came, they already had the full, full meal. But nobody seemed to be up chucking or sick. So, you know, I, I thought it was good. They, they, they had... To me, it's better than cooked meat because you could directly... I hate to say it, but blood and things like that were all scooped up. And I mean, those people were hungry. They were, they were really hungry. Then when you, when you think about the German population, they didn't have very much to eat themselves. But at least they had vegetables and things. But 
this was a big meal for the uh, people from the camp. Yeah. And I, I felt good for them, you know. We didn't have anything to give at that time because I was on our way, way back. But that, to me, really impressed to me the extent the human being would go. Yeah. And that that's okay, Thomas. It's a good experience for me. Do you remember from which direction that you approached the camp? Was it south, north, east? Do you have any? I just because of you know we were on a tank and uh, we we didn't even have a, a compass, but you just call back, just tell your position, and it'll tell you where where to look for the base point. Was there a smell to the camp that you could tell? You know, I didn't get close enough to the building, but I know. From what I've seen, the people that were able to walk out of camp, the first thing they'll do is bathe and drink water. And that would indicate that they didn't have the luxury of bathing. And that water was cold. Water was cold. What was the weather like? You know, when I think back from May 1st, May 1st we had snow on the ground. You remember the lieutenant, he must have been new they just replaced uh, in that particular area. See, we're going to go across that huge meadow. My our lieutenant, I, I don't know whether it was Lieutenant Finley or uh, Lieutenant uh, Binari. He said, oh, no, we're not. Because if you're going to be out in the open, you'll stand up like a sore thumb. You know, that, that, that's how... Sometimes it's very ironic that you have troop leaders don't even have the basic to say, hey, we're going to do take another route, maybe go, go down the ravine or a ditch. Because you out there in the open, you're going to be fired if, if they're waiting for you. Yeah. Mm. Let me go back to the people that you saw. You said they had, wh what kind of clothing did they have on? It's almost like a, a cloth, cloth clothing with stripes on it. Stripes. And then they had the cap with stripes marking on it. But I don't think it was uh, wool. I, I don't think. They could have undergarment different, but I know they... You almost remind me of a canvas type of uh, dungaree type of uh, material. Do you remember if they had coats? They had. If did they have coats in the snow? No, there's no luxury like that. Whatever they had on, they, they're gonna make it out. They didn't care where they were gonna go. They got. It was held. We headed to the front. We see them walking to the. We, we we're coming back. They're coming back. To, they had no idea, probably. They, they were disoriented. That, that was, I think it was, yeah. Did you notice their shoes, if they had shoes? Some did. Some did. And then whatever they had, whatever sandals they could, it's an open sandal. There's a few of them with bare feet, yeah. Did you see any barracks, or were you aware of any barracks in the camp? You said they were two-story, but did, did you go inside? No. We, we, our time was too short at, at the camp. Did you see any piles of bodies? No, I didn't see any. Did you see anything that could have been a crematorium or um, anything like that? No, not in that camp. Not in that camp. Did you see it anywhere else? Some, some of my friends told me that cow had, then they told me those crematorium was actually a baking oven that we juiced it up with uh, much more uh, just to cremate and when I went back this last 50 year uh, at that Dachau camp and so the still yet there's the whole they, they didn't clean up the area they, they left whatever there is to see if you go back to there. I knew right away those were cremated bones. So 
all the lady folks didn't know. I remember uh, no, none of the men ever stepped on it. We stayed away because it's kind of slight mound. Is then when <laughs> when we want to bust somebody, say you know, folks knew what you were standing on. You know that that really shook the women folks. But you know if you don't know anything about it, well, it's all right. I know my wife had it. Got got after me because why didn't you tell me? I'm not gonna be. You know, I I just knew it was something different. I mean, every place has the soil, and all of a sudden you come just white ashes and bone parts. Yeah. I want to go back to when you said you saw the prisoner with the Jewish star. You said you had when you went back. You saw people just going in different directions. Mm. Did you see men and women? No, that's a good question. Only men. Well, what I recall, only men. That's right. Did you see any children? No, no children. In fact, I, I don't know if I've seen, uh, and in that area, women and children, just men. C did you get close enough? You said you saw one Jewish star you started to explain that, and I interrupted you before. You said you saw someone with the Jewish star on. Mm -hmm. Did you see others with the Jewish star? No, that one particular person, yeah. Did you see any that might have had triangles that would have on, on them that had different colors? No, no, just, just a st uh, star of David, yeah. Did and he was makeshift, I know, he just wanted when I think about it now, it's not one that be made before he he just sold sold it on. And that's d difficult now that you think about sewing on a uh, what do you call it, Star of David. Yeah. Were you told who the prisoners were or the survivors were? Were you told anything about them after the fact? To to whom? Well, did anybody else after you went into the camp? Then were you told what you saw, or how did you find out what you were really viewing and the people that were viewing? How did you find out who these people were and what was going on? The surprising part of it, nobody knew who they were and why. And I'm, I'm pretty sure the rest of the interviewers is going to have the same, because I had no idea. I figured, well, there's a, there's a prison of war or a prison of labor, you know. Did you speak to any of the prisoners? No, I did not. The survivors? Yeah, no. Were you given any orders about dealing with them? No. About talking no. with them? No. We moved out too fast. The only instruction we have was don't fraternize with the German people or the troops. But nothing about these survivors? No, no. So you don't know if civilians were brought into the camp or anything? No. How long do you s would you think you were in that camp? In the camp that I was, maybe 10 minutes. We just moved out. As soon as we get in there, we say, hey, let's, everybody just moved out. And then later when you saw these the people walking, mm -hmm. what was the worst part for you? It's not the people walking. It's the people in, left in the camp. They weren't able to do anything for themselves. Like I said, these fortunate ones were able to break out of camp and move about. And then, uh, you know, whatever food they could uh, pick up. See, in Germany, during that time of the season, which is May, June, they still had uh, sugar, uh, sugar beets. They, they put it in a soil and cover it up with soil, so you could dig that out. And that's, you have moisture, you have sugar, and you have fiber. You know, I've seen that being dug up too. Yeah. And uh, most of the uh, I had had that experience in Italy. Most of the abandoned, some of the. Uh, farmers abandoned because they didn't know what was going to happen. 
what we usually do is look up the chimney. They usually hang up the uh, meat, you know, the sausages, meat. Germany was known for sausage, but Italy, for sure, you had sausages. But once, going back again in, to Italy, I looked up, I was, I looked up and I said, we better not even mess with the house because they was rigged with dynamite. So if we had just pull on it, the whole house would go. But you know, that that's the doing, uh, uh, what was the term, booby trapping. Yeah. But in Germany it was the same. The cellar had apple, kartoffel, which is potato, and all that, you know. But I noticed the uh, prisoners, I mean those inmates, uh, were helping themselves to the, the uh, sugar beets and stuff like that. But I thought uh, they'll do all right because, you know, when you, when you starve to that extent. But I've never seen the hoarding. They're going to eat what is available there. I never seen anybody with a sack, okay? So it's not a matter of we're going to take back or for reserve. We're going to take what come to us. And that's, I think that's survival. One of the things so you eat first. You get yourself satisfied. Then you take care of the balance. I may be wrong. Were you given any orders about whether you could feed these people or not? No, they didn't need to, because whatever food that was left, when you came back, you're going to have hot meal. We didn't dump it into a garbage pail. Or no. we, th I remember our cook provided square pan to bring, and then that was given to whoever was around there. Did you see any uh, any other medical attention other than trying to give the intravenous? That's that's what last I saw of in the camp. Did the GIs help with any clothing or anything like that for the inmates? See that came usually when, when the uh, troop father coming up would provide. And that's been my experience. Yeah. Did you ever have a chance to discuss this with any of the German civilians around? A big part. Did you have a chance or did you discuss the inmates or the survivors with any of the, the German no. civilians? No. Did you have any contact with any no, German I civilians? Haven't. Did you take any photos of what you saw or the people you saw? No, only the combat. Uh, Photographers had that privilege. We, nobody had uh, cameras or film or anything. And then, where did you go after that? When you say where? After, after you, the liberation, that part of it, where did your unit go? We were headed for Birch's Garden, the, the, uh, the eagle's nest for Hitler. Okay. But uh, the airborne got there first, so we, I mean, we were relieved and we went back. Because that we were told that they're going to defend at all costs. I think it was the 101st Airborne, I think, went in there. And then what did the 442nd do then? What, did, what happened to you after that? 442nd wasn't in Germany. They pulled back to Italy. Well, I forgot to tell you, they, sh they asked for the artillery unit to go because they needed the firepower to negotiate the Rhine River crossing. And then we, s we stayed there, provide the firepower to whatever units that were designated to us for that purpose. And then what, what did happen to you personally after that? Did you continue in the military? Did you do any other oh, okay. special training or anything? We came back to Nuremberg, I remember, because they asked for volunteers. No, we came back to Donauwert. That's that area that had all the feeder camps and concentration camps. 
and we stayed there at, at a holding pattern. Then they asked for volunteers to go to Japan. We're still f uh, fighting Japan. So 90 of us volunteered as interpreters. Yeah. As long as your name is Tojo Smith, they're going to take you. But uh, because nobody <coughs> said you, but I, I could give me a week and I would pick up the language, you know, because I've been, I grew up with that. But we came back and we were tra in training when the war ended. The war in the Pacific? Yes, yes. That's why, uh, the reason why well, most of us volunteered, they guaranteed us a week in Hawaii before we jumped off into Japan. So they, one of the requirements was go airborne. Yeah. So it, one of the things is, I still remember one of the group session I, I attended. So one of the questions I asked uh, the instructor, what are we going to have, two parachutes? You know, the, the regular parachute troopers, they have one in the front, one in the back. He said, no, one. I said, why one? He said, you won't have the chance to open up the second chute because if you're going to fly over and jump into the area we're told we're going to jump into, you're going to be jumping at about eight or 900 feet. You're going to open up and you're going to hit the rice paddies. Okay. So that I thought, oh my God, <laughs> you know, forget about the second parachute. But we we didn't even get to the parachute training portion before the war ended. But I know a group session they were talking like that. And I said, Oh, well, what did we get into, you know? You were being trained then to go into Japan? Did, did they tell you what the training was about? What you were to do other than jump into the rice paddy? No, I I had the impression that we were going to jump in nearby into the prisoner of war camp and liberate, not only liberate, but tell the Japanese population not to harm those people. Yeah, so I still remember, you know, thinking, Jesus, but you're not supposed to take any arms. But I remember that drill, the sergeant telling, I said, what about the, uh, the equipment the Japanese have? They don't have anything except bamboo pointed. I mean, it'd be, it'd be a snap you coming down, you know? So whatever it was, uh, it, um, it's a good thing we didn't have to jump. Yeah. Then when, what happened after the war was over? And what, what happened to you personally? Well... I came back, and they asked us again in Hawaii to volunteer to go to Japan. By then, I had enough of war. So I stayed around for a while. Then I went to uh, six of us. Said, well, let's go stateside. Because that's the only chance we had with a GI Bill of Rights so we could at least but when I came back here, I spent two years doing uh, at Hickam Air Base, learning to be a machinist. But see, that took up two years of my, so I spent only two and a half years doing academic work over there at Michigan State. Yeah. Uh, I still remember the uh, counselor at Michigan State and told you get the H out of agriculture. You're not going to do you no good. But, you know, those people, counselors are trained to do that. So what am I going to get into? He said, get into industrial relation. Now, I didn't know whether industrial relation mean being upper echelon farmer or what, you know, but however he told me you get into the industry, you your record grades would show you that you had to do better. I should have taken his advice because I ended up doing whatever 
he stayed when I came back. Yeah, I, I spent 10 years at University of Hawaii. Yeah. Doing what? I mostly, see this, this is the irony of the whole thing. I, I handled a research budget. So I took people to Thailand, Taiwan, Tokyo. I, I mean, we had a ball, <laughs> you know, but uh, we, we had, we have a huge cadre of uh, academia of Yet University with PhD doing nothing. That's why they call about brain drain that go to state side to work. Now I don't blame them, but we even to this day we have a huge, uh, and like in any university, and just like in civil service, you practically have to die before you could come up the ranks. But this young person that we have, university, we have sharp, smart kids. Like, of course, like any uh, higher education, the, the area of expertise is maybe this wide. But that's okay, but they're good at it. They're good at it. I always used to tell the uh, people who pro give me proposal, and I got criticized for it too, that doing research is not 90% 90, 90 correct, 10% error. I say it's 100% error. Because research is something you get into something new that you don't uh, understand. But I see the fallout from all the mistakes you have encountered going to be a plus for the next person coming along. So try, <laughs> I remember talking to the one senator who was in charge of budget. He told me, Tojo, you mean to tell me it's 100% failure? I said, yes. Says, you know, he said, I cannot buy that. Then I had to convince him that whatever fallout you get in for it, that the p big plus. Y you don't expect guarantee. There's no, that's why I used to t tell those researchers, don't expect uh, guarantee it's going to come out. But people who who's up, up in the legislature providing the funds, they're not going to buy that. No. But you see, you must be crazy. And I, I stuck to that, and I was criticized heavily for it, you know? But in retrospect, today when I think about it, the research is that you cannot guarantee we have, we had, uh, when I left, we had some research going on, going to really, you talk about uh, gene splicing and stuff. That was, that was a coming thing. Today, it's almost full blown, but it was very exciting. But you have cadre of young PhDs sitting over there just raring to go. And that to me, that's, that's we, we, we need to, explore that area a little more. We need to explore that area because these are the people who are going to be doing what they're going to benefit from. We're not. We, we just are passed by. We're just going out, you know, so. You, but when you get into academia, it's a little different. You better have, it's, it's only studies and documentation. And that's not going to help. I want you to do something in your project, and then you cannot go ahead and make all the mistakes. I said, don't worry about failures. you got to expect it. But I never give them a figure 90 or 10 or 50 or 50. That That is, to me, I think you're going to have a uh, I think we'll end this tape and continue. Yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry. But we do, you know. Uh, 
This is tape five, January 26, 1998. The liberator is Tadashi Tojo, interviewer Tony Catch Binstock in Honolulu, Hawaii, United States of America, and is being done in English. I want to go back a little bit to some of your military information. Mm -hmm. um, were you ever decorated? Yes, I had the Bronze Star, Soldier's Medal, and the Distinguished Unit Badge, three of them. And of course, the Good Conduct Medal. Would you tell about how you got those? Well, Bronze Star was in action. Uh, that was in, uh, that was, I think, in France. But the Soldier's Medal was given to me for saving a child life, a child's life, in the Danube River. Uh, I remember one day four of us jumped in because the little girl uh, fell into the in the middle of the bridge. Somebody must have uh, scared her, <laughs> and then she just jumped off the bridge. So all of us jumped in and rescued that little kid. But then the river could be wide and fast. Yeah, it could be deep. That area was fast, really fast. So it wasn't that easy as far as uh, uh, the one that I've written out. She used to come by. My, I was MP. Uh, I was in charge of the 30, 30 people, MP. We had our own post right next to the river. Was this before or after the end of after the war? After the war, yeah. Well, I gotta tell you, uh, I was transferred from the battery, the firing air, to headquarters, and they elevated me to sergeant to take charge of this group. Now, The irony of this is, you know, I could not help any of the pe the prisoner of war or the inmates, but saving a German child, they'll decorate you with a soldier's medal. And I thought, well, I'm a soldier's medal, but soldier's medal is, a, I think in 442nd, I think we have only about seven or eight and our group, no, maybe 10, our group took four, you know, but it wasn't a medal, it's just the idea that we save a child's life. I mean, we had no idea. Normally, I won't go in and swim in that river, but she used to come by my office at the river, and you'd say good, good morning, and she'd say niceties. A nice little child, about eight, eight or nine. Uh, the moment we were passing the child from one person to the other because of the swiftness of the river, no sooner she recognized me, she just hung on. But we were going to go under otherwise, so I had to just keep on pushing it to another person. But anyway, when we finished that, I still remember, on the 58th anniversary, I went back looking for her. Uh, but she was she already had passed away. She had family, so I, t I told one of the relatives in town, Donna Ware, that I'll be back within three years. Give me a three years, and this, this year gonna be the third year. And I intend to go back. And I was surprised that when we went there, Tetsukiyama historian wrote to some people over there in Heidelberg. And the newspaper picked up, the TV people picked up, and was wondering what all the commotion were. And I was the only one of the people that saved they were looking for Tojo. I said, oh, no. Japan was the same thing. When it was in France, the Japanese uh, TV company, so I have good friends. 
they came looking for me too over there on that lost battalion thing. Okay. They they wrote it up and I was invited. I went back on the deck outing. I went invited to go back to the town where Sugihara, remember that? That uh, diplomat? Yeah, I, I, I did go back there. But, it, it, but we, we're getting away from the story. But today I have the girl's, little girl's picture, three, the family picture. and her grave. She's buried in Ulm, you know, where Martin Luther had, okay. So I said, I'll be back. Within three years, I'll come back. I don't know, I'm too old now, I don't know whether I'm going to make it, but I said, I'll be back. <laughs> and I will too. When, you, when were you discharged then from the service? I don't think I had asked that. Nineteen... 43, 44, 45, latter part of 45, November in fact, uh, 45, yeah. And did you marry? Yes. And whom did you marry? Uh, her name was Harriet Harui Yoshioka. I better remember that because it's going to be... Okay. Did you know her from before the war or meet her afterwards? No, I met her after the war, yeah. And do you have children? One boy and two daughters. And what are their names, please? If one, Dennis, Lisa, and Sophie. Yeah. And how about grandchildren? Two. And what are their names? He's just asking me for my birthday. I, in fact, I, I it's all t I've typewritten. I, I, I couldn't remember the name. Yeah. Me, one was one was Miyuki. I know, but. Uh, <laughs> and you said you did go back to school in in Wisconsin, and Michigan. I mean Michigan. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Has what you experienced affected your attitudes and values? your experiences during the war and the liberation? Mm -hmm. Has it affected your attitudes and values in any way? In fact, I think you'd be surprised to hear, but I learned tolerance. I really learned tolerance. The other person, I always look at another person who's going to be one better than you in something all the time. Aside from that, everybody is equal. Just understand. You get a Chinese uh, a person that used to work for me at uh, the department uh, in a state. He, I think he was he was a Tai Chi person. You know what Tai Chi is? He was an expert in that. He was very light on his foot, and he had. To beautiful move, almost dance, a uh, ballet-like movement, but he taught the ladies in the department, Tai Chi. But he, he really impressed on me about tolerance. Just understand the next human being is just as good and always one better than you. Now he was, he handled uh, the cleanup he came early in the morning, so we had a lot of time sitting down talking. But already by then, I told myself, you know, the only thing you can do is be tolerant of one another. Because, you know, you, you, I, I never in my life felt superior. I always say, that person is one better than I am. Always one. Something you could do, whether it's it's, it's uh, academia, whether it's being able to do something, always one better. That, that's my philosophy today. Mm. Did any of your war experiences affect your religious beliefs? No, I, I still, uh, I don't go to church, I gotta admit, as often as I should be doing, but uh, no, it has never changed, never changed. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Did you tell your family and friends about what you experienced? See, my parents, my family never knew what was going on on our front. I never wrote what we had experienced, never, until I came back. Give me, they, they thought, the war is war, and they're just going to read, read how many people died. They, they just, my mother told me they anticipated, like, tomorrow I'll be gone, because I don't write about anything. I don't think it was necessary, yeah. You have been asked to speak at groups, you said. Uh, mm. is those Are those Holocaust groups that you've been asked to speak at no. about your liberation experience? School children. What do you tell them? Well, it's very difficult for children to understand uh, man in human treatment to another. But I just told them that uh, they had people incarcerated, and this was some of the thing I saw. But even then, I, they, this question come popping out, and which is good, but I don't think they could understand the, uh, the impact of what the, the hu inhuman treatment that goes about. You know, that's to me is, I don't know how to explain to that extent where they say, oh, yes, you know. But at that age, you know, it's just, wow, he's, you know, he's been out there doing something. That, that's okay, too. But that's the only thing I regret. But the older generation that I spoke to, they're very uh, astute about uh, treatment. But at none at any time we discuss the treatment we had. You know, but I don't think it's necessary. You already had that, that's finished, and you know, let's get on with it. Yeah. Have you talked about your experiences with your children and grandchildren? I never did. Never did. I think if this thing is on tape, <laughs> it's going to be a repercussion here. Yeah. But, you know, it's that when you told me that, you know, I mean, get a tape. I thought they'd be fine. I hope they'll listen to it, you know? Yeah. Have your experiences affected your choices in life, do you think? No. I just wanted to get, get ahead and do what is necessary for me to in life. What is your attitude toward the German people now? You said you had returned and will probably go back. What is your attitude toward the German people now? You know, it's just like being in the army. Myself, I don't think they had choice. I, the general public now. Now, in the military, you are asked to do things. But the general public, I sometimes wonder if they knew what was going on. You know, he, Himmler did a terrific job of propagandizing, but you need to do that to get the to have the country as cohesive as possible. That's what I think. But that's good and that's bad. Okay, but I don't think when when I, I really uh, appreciated the general public in Germany right after the war. You know, you get to understand. But I never asked them what was the hardship or anything, but you could tell all the bridges, the, the uh, American Army sure did a good job of the logistic portion. They really broke up all the highways and the bridges, and transportation system was in a chaos, yeah. But otherwise, uh, this war will be still be on. Do you still keep in touch with people from your unit? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And you said you have, uh, an, is it annual meetings at the 442nd? Just, no, I, I am on a board now, so I, every month on a Monday, uh, first Monday of a month, we'll attend meeting. But let me tell you, every meeting we have, we have to 
go through who passed away last week or last month. No, that's the truth. They really, the number, the attrition rate is fantastic, you know. Yeah. Have you had any contact with any of the people you might have liberated? You know, I have the address and everything, so when I go back, I'm just going to do it. I don't want any any meeting with newspaper people. In fact, it was written off in a paper. And they gave me a couple of them that I brought back, but I really wanted to see the Horoba family, the Lupin, uh, this uh, Carola family, and there's another family, these three family I really wanted to. Were they Jewish families? No. German families? No. One, that one family was a Polish, Lipinski. Yeah, th I'm sure because of the name, but the rest, Horba and, <sighs> yes, what was the other name? But I know they were German, yeah. And were those people you liberated? You mean that, that particular town? Yes, yes, yes. Do you have, do you suffer any long-term effects of your exper war experiences? Maybe some corner, but it made me stronger. Because you, you could, you're not afraid to just face it. You know, you're not, one of the things, I, I wasn't, even to this day, when you, it's a mortal being saying that I'm not afraid of death, that to me really instilled in me, yeah. But I always tell the, I guess it's compassion. You look at the other person, he has problems more than you think you have, you know. To me that is good, because I got problems, yeah, hi, you know, I, I do, but one of my friends told me, you sound like a preacher. But that's not it, you know, it's just your attitude <coughs> in life. I always look at another person as he got as much problem as I do, and we are going to do it. Yeah. What do you say to those who, te who say to you that the Holocaust never happened? I've written up on that because, in fact, the ending part, I said, Eugene O'Neill sa stated that uh, history just repeats itself over and over again. I said, that doesn't answer my, but it's just what I feel inside me. But I was surprised to read, and then I was criticized to, in fact, somebody wanted to edit it out. I said, no, that, you know, we need to talk about the skinhead and this rebel rousers over there in the United States. They claim that never existed or happened. And you know, I, I sometimes wonder, how could you ever say that? So maybe it's important that we document this oral history. I'm not here for uh, embellish, or just, but that's what I had experienced. It's not anybody telling me, go there and make a statement. That's, to me, if that's the I have no purpose, no no end of coming here. But to me, that's today. It's very important because you have a whole mass group of people thinking in that term. Now, you know, sometimes you will think that you wish they would go through something like that and experience it. But the world is not made like that. So. But I couldn't believe when the skinheads and, and the rebel rousers over there, the neo-Nazis, it's, it's very difficult. But they may have their reason, so there's not for me to criticize, you know? That that's, that's to me is something that I, I still cannot take it and say, okay, I understand. There's no way I could do that. 
so now that over 50 years have passed mm. since the war ended is there any message you'd like to give to your children your grandchildren or to the world in general like I say have I don't know how long it would take an individual to understand that uh, what's that do unto others but you know it, it comes a time where you start to you not start you realize that you know, you have to have compassion for your fellow men. That is, is heavy on me today. Uh, aside from that, I won't say anything. You know, I cannot tell, well, Tony, it's going to be this way. It's going to be that way. You need to have that experience. You have to go through that, and nobody, no one can do that for you. You yeah. know, that's, to me, I would like to leave uh, a message. It's strange to be to be talking and uh, speaking like this to you because that's what never had happened before. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's been. I guess it's one of the benefits of growing old. Not that you're gonna pass. Like I said, uh, you know, it's the fear of anything. I lost that a long time ago. I think the first day of battle, you're either going to survive or not. So after that, I don't know. I'm not, it's not that I'm afraid of something, no. I'm going to face it, and if, it, if I cannot surmount it, you have to take a different avenue. That, to me, today is what, uh, but for the short time I, I have, I said, no, there's no, no, no time for animosity. No time to say, hey, I, I don't agree with you. It's not that you're going to agree with anything, but a personal opinion is very dear and valuable to that individual. You know, how can you say that's wrong? I mean, no judge. I'm no judge about that. That, to me, is, is a legacy. And like my children, I... I said, the only thing I can leave you folks is education. But like I said, I always tell my wife, my boy went to school, university, six years. So he must have been measuring in surfing every day. <laughs> but you know, it was like that. Uh, most of the instructor at that time when he was in school was in, in battle with us. So I thought, what the heck are you for? I'm sorry for using the word. What are you doing? You know, taking them six years. I said, give them time. I, I, also, I practically gave up. I don't think he would ever make it, you know. <laughs> Is there anything that I forgot to ask you or anything that you want to talk about today? I think I talked enough. I think we, I, it's my limit <laughs> over there. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you so very much for giving your testimony today and for documenting your Well, Tony, it was my pleasure. I, I just love to talk, I guess. But it, it's an experience or documentation. It's very good to leave back because you cannot be doing interview. you asking me very salient, pointed question that I have to think back. Too bad it's been almost 50 years, you know, but it, it comes back. Like all our reunion, I don't think we talk about anything else but what happened then, you see. But that's it. Well, again, thank you so very much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. This is tape six, January 26, 1998. The liberator is Tadashi Tojo, 
interviewer Tony Catch Binstock in Honolulu, Hawaii, United States of America, and it's being done in English. And Mr. Tojo, tell me about this picture. This was taken in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, around April or May, 1943, after we got there. And who was in the picture? Myself, yeah. And what is this? Tell, tell about this one. This was a news uh, item that came out just around, say, of May or June of 43. And uh, I don't know when or where this, they got my features. <laughs> I guess they got it correct, but uh, I really don't know on what photograph or was handed to them. And the character on the top to the right is my name in Japanese. Character on the left of above my ear. The, the character in Japanese? Yeah. And what does that say? Tadashi. And what does the other say in English below it? Tojo in the USA. What does it do with their, their putting it on the CD-ROM? That's what, that's what, that's, that's what Eric does, he's a professional CD-ROM guy. Yeah. Why do they tell, well, about. listen, if, you know, if you zoom real slow, if I did a real slow move, I mean, unless... Well, if you want to do it, you know, then I can holler it. <laughs> that was good. Can you read what it says at the bottom there? Mm-hmm. What does that say at the bottom? <laughs> Tojo is in the is in the U U S A. The name of a Hawaiian soldier of Japanese descent. But it's amazing how. The news people would get, I mean, I could pass for that facsimile, <laughs> but I cannot understand, but I don't know who sent it, but I know. And what, tell me about this picture. This picture was taken over the Danube River in the back, and uh, that, that bridge that the American destroyed in the background also. Now you see the opening between uh, the base and the uh, top of the railing is an opening. That's where the child fell through into the river. The Japanese uh, Buddhist church is writing up another uh, article and experience. They're writing up a book uh, for us, and they asked me to. Uh, write up a story for them and also I have loaned them the blown up version of that particular picture. Okay. What is this picture? The person without the cap is Rufus Tojo. He's from Ohio. Now there was two Tojo in the U.S. Army. I'm standing to the left of Rufus in that photograph. And to our right? Yes, yes. And where was this taken? This was taken in Donnaworth also. That's the area that we liberated and we came back to this particular town of Donnaworth. What's the building in the back? Okay, that building is typical of uh, the type of uh, chalet type of building that they had over there in Donnaworth and that whole area. 
Is that the type of building that was a concentration camp? No, 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 no. That's the individual uh, homes. No, that's Which right. side do we show? This show? side, this oh, side, yeah. this side. Yeah, it should be okay. You know what? The it's front. Interesting. Yeah, the front. Okay. Oh, we do both sides. <coughs> that's the only <laughs> diploma I ever had. <laughs> the only diploma. See, I think what it is, people zoom too fast. Maybe. You see, Maybe. Because what I could do is I could start. I can start real tight like this. Mm -hmm. We'll do a static, and just a slow pull out like this is is just not going to zoom. It's just not going to jitter. But I mean, you know, they, no, don't, they, they don't have to use it if they don't want to. That no, way, everything, talking, everything. See, yeah. just come right out and stop like that. Okay. It's okay with me. So, As I so say what we'll do is we'll, we'll give 10 seconds of a static in the beginning. I'll zoom out and we'll just let him talk on the wide shot and they've got the whole thing and then we'll toss what they need. They won't toss anything. That's what I'm telling you. Nothing is, this is not edited. It's as is. Yeah. Documentary. Mm -hmm. Archives. And tell me about this one. This is the honorable dis uh, not honorable discharge. Say <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> so, say what this is again, please. This is the uh, honorable discharge paper that I received when I separated from the uh, army. Like I said, this is the only diploma I ever had. Great. I love this one. Got oh. And this picture? Tell me about this picture. This was taken next to the Beaumont Tower near the uh, library at that time. Uh, the tower was a, you know, where they go, somebody would go in and play the chimes, and I distinctly remember that, that area. But uh, they made beautiful music on Sundays and Saturdays. And where was this taken? Michigan State. College in East Lansing, Michigan. About how old were you here? Well, that's a good question. Twenty five, yeah. And what is this? This is the uh, committee that wrote up uh, the uh, Holocaust Project. Uh, was headed by uh, uh, Jesus, the attorney. Uh, oh man! Here in Hawaii. Yes. Uh, Ted. Ted Tsukiyama. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But this has most of the documentation, time, place, and area. And uh, I think it's one of the better uh, Holocaust Committee group that uh, did this work.
Yeah, it's not straight. I forgot to say, say it's a kind of candidate. They'll <laughs> never know this. One. I hope not. <laughs> For most of the work I do, they everybody would just yell. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Okay. Um, I don't know if that'll hold back or what's the best. This just maybe this is his. Um, it, should I do that one or should I do this one? Oh, this is a two-page one. Yeah, one one page. There's more than you know. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Well, can you key in on some neat word? Oh, I don't know. Just go okay. like that. Just see, told you on here. Uh, yes, right. Here. right. Mm -hmm. Bar by your compound, Auschberg, to release the scar of emaciated your sorry walking zombies. And he said that, so maybe walking zombies. Do we need to push this back? Yeah, that'd be nice. Let's see. Can you right put here. a round piece of tape on Would the you back mm -hmm. side of that one? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's you got one. Your husband's got it. Oh, okay. Okay, walking zombies right there. That was Auschberg. See, I didn't didn't have that down. The eyewitnesses in this attempt to destroy the yeah. barbed wire and obey the walking zombies. I referred to it as Augsburg, but that was the largest town nearby. What is this part then? This this is uh, when we went into the uh, compound, but I put down Auschwitz. This was written earlier, but when uh, when Augsburg was actually the largest town nearby, but what what had had occurred was it was in and around Donauwert, uh, from what I understand. And this article. When did you write this? This, if you have no idea. But uh, after I came back, I wrote this. So it must must have been. Uh, this was the first article. In fact, I wrote up the, in the back. But I. I it, it escaped me. I don't know when I wrote that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what is this? This was the 50th anniversary of <clears throat> the uh, 522nd Field Artillery Battalion. Uh, I was in Abel Battery. We had three batteries, Abel, Baker, and Charlie. Those are gun section. And it was held uh, in 1993. Where was it held? In Honolulu. And we had a whole group of people that came from the mainland. 